And I'll talk about molecular testing with next-gen sequencing role in urology. Obviously, this is a huge topic. So my goal for this was just to kind of bring in a lot of what you've been hearing through the conference and, and focus it down and um, uh, talk about NGS. So this is, I'll talk a little bit about DNA, then RNA, dark DNA, and, and with a microbiome twist for this session here. Um, so you can see at the top, uh, the, all these environmental factors, genetics, age, dietary habit, and I say that the microbiome kind of encompasses everything from genetics uh, to age to dietary, and kind of incorporates all of those things can influence your microbiome. So instead of doing your uh, nine-page dietary questionnaire and all the questionnaires that you usually fill out for research, uh, the simple microbiome may be replacing some of those things. So DNA, it's a powerful tool, but when we talk about DNA NGS sequencing, we're talking about the germline or the tumor. So the germline, you can have P53 mutations or BRCA mutations. Uh, for the tumor, there's you know, T2ERG or SPOP mutations. So you send these off to various companies here that, that will sequence the tumor for you. There's also copy number losses and, and variation, structural variation. So that's what kind of DNA NGS is about. And the best, uh, is just a genetic history, essentially. So you get a family history, uh, that would be the best indication of having a genetic issue, and then germline testing, and then there's SNP testing, which can look at a huge swaths of uh, genetic differences in people and can be used for screening purposes and um, uh, dividing people into high and low risk. So that's what NGS of DNA looks like. So RNA, different type of uh, tool, largely use uh, RNA-seq as an initial tool, and then you can hone down your sequencing, and many of the companies here that use uh, sequencing technology to tell you, should, should I do another biopsy, is this aggressive or not? These are the, t these are the um, uh, technologies that they're using, looking at signaling pathways and things like that, but microbiome is one of those RNAs that are in there, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So just looking at this, what can you do with RNA NGS. On the upper right hand corner you kind of see that blue to red scale. So you can you can start, uh, and this was you know part of Mark Rubin's work uh, that, that is recent that came out. So at the bottom you can see the genetics and you're combining some DNA with RNA and you can get whole profiles of the uh, tumor uh, based on that biopsy. So I want to talk about dark DNA. So that's another NGS topic, uh, and this looks at the non-coding DNA. So things that are not typically uh, talked about, but non-coding uh, RNA, like microRNAs, they can start influencing how, how DNA reacts and acts. Long non-coding RNAs, which are being incorporated in some of the urinary biomarkers coming up. I know Rural Chennai's lab in Michigan's been working on some of that, and some of the other labs here have probably looked into it too. Um, and identifying uh, DNA methylation and histone, so all these can, can be used in NGS. So I just kind of wanted to get through those definitions to all the different facets of how you can use um, uh, different types of NGS. So this is long non-coding RNAs that you can get from urine and how that can modulate P10 cancers uh, and AKT pathway uh, in prostate cancer. So I wasn't gonna go into all of these pathways, but just when you see uh, MER, uh, microRNAs and things like that, that's what they're looking into. But I feel like we've thrown a lot of this out. So a lot of people have been focusing on the actual uh, genetic of the tumor, but we just throw a lot of this DNA away. So now finally we have the technology to start looking at, okay, how can we look at um, uh, the microbiome or dark DNA that we kind of used to throw away. So there are potential therapeutic targets in this space. The impact of antibiotics that we talked about we can identify new biomarkers and then uh, drug resistance as well. And so when we talk about microbial, there's culture and NGS, so we all know about culture. But when, we, when you want to find a specific organism like an infection, we would do a culture, you take the sample off, and then you would do whole genome sequencing, and you just get the information about that specific bacteria. Then there's, on the top here, there's amplicon sequencing and metagenomics. So amplicon is just using 16S RNA, so each microbe has a specific genetic uh, genes in their RNA that can tell you what they are, and then there's specific uh, genes within that bacteria that can tell you what can they do with it. Uh, whereas whole genome sequencing, or we call shotgun 
uh, genomic sequencing just kind of gives you a huge swath of what, what bacteria are present. Now, I typically like to do 16S because it amplifies it a little bit and tells you a little bit more of uh, what may be more important in that per, per, um, person. And we've been working with um, Microgen to do a lot of the 16S and shotgun metagenomics with some of these new uh, technologies that are coming out. So sequencing for microbes is a lot like sequencing for um, uh, prostate tissue or germline genetics. But here you're just tagging, like, what are the bacteria? Are they? What's there? Uh, how, what abundance are they in? And then their, their taxonomic distribution. And this is a, a kind of a famous slide from the Human Microbiome Project. And that's where the biome came from, right? The, the swab from the uh, oral mucosa is going to be different from the gastrointestinal mucosa. And you can kind of start three-dimensionally figuring out where these different bacteria live. So after they figured that out, it really exploded on scene for microbes. And when we're talking about prostate cancer, there's two kind of fields uh, that are developing. One is this top row where diet can impact on what we just talked about, some social influences, can impact the gut microbiome. And there's different ways the gut can influence prostate cancer. And then there's actually the, what's the microbes in the prostate that can come out in the urine. And so those uh, can, can um, directly, so I call it direct versus indirect, so and directly interact with the cancers. So he had just, uh, Priya just showed this uh, a slide with Microgen DX. You can kind of see there's more green, you know, and you can start figuring out, okay, these two groups are, are probably different. And so this is kind of one of the first steps you would do. But, you know, UCSD and Rob Knight's group had shown that when you take the tissue and you sequence it, you can actually predict really well that just the microbes that are present, and why would that be? And we think it's likely because when you form a cancer that, that that's going to have a different metabolic pathway and that environment's going to be different. So the bacteria are now allowed to grow, uh, uh, different microbes are allowed to grow in cancer than non-cancer patients. And obviously inflammation uh, and prostatitis that we talked about will skew this one way or another. So you have to be really careful about the symptoms that you're taking and what antibiotics are they on. Um, but this is where next gen sequencing can really start uh, impacting the biomarkers. And this is our study where we took, we don't really know what's normal. So we just showed in the last slide that 50% of these people, men after a DRE, they urinate and 50% of them have bacteria there. So I think that's some of the worries with ne next gen sequencing is that we may be over treating or finding different bacteria that, oh, I haven't seen this before, maybe I need to treat it. So you have to be careful and really match up your symptoms. And if you think there's an infection, that, that would be a person to treat. Here we're looking at prostate cancer and what's changing within uh, cancers. So, on the, uh, we looked at men after DRE, we took prostatectomy tissue. After the prostatectomy or after the prostate was taken out, we sequenced those men. And then we used normal men before and after the DRE because we didn't know if pushing on the prostate would actually cause different microbes to be there. And then in a Venn diagram, we just kind of um, used that to see which are the unique types of bacteria that would be associated with prostate cancer. We went through a series of uh, AI and machine learning algorithms and found a, a pathway of like about 20 bacteria that can predict uh, a, a man's prostate cancer risk. And this was our uh, first validation set at 84% for our AUC. Uh, and we compared it to PSA density, which was only 56% in this group. So we're showing that so far, uh, this may be a, a potential biomarker. And then microbiomes are linked. Uh, this has been shown in, in other groups um, when they also do a, a post-DRE. And you can see this uh, on the left side of the screen. There's a lot of different clusters that can form. This is what machine learning is doing now, taking all this genetic data and putting people in boxes to see, okay, um, maybe they respond differently. So what about the gut microbiome? How does that really, inf how, how can the gut microbiome influence prostate cancer? So we had published this article in uh, European Urology a few years back showing that uh, we do show a better, um, almost, as be almost as well as PSA density, uh, and that some of the, these folate, biotin, arginine biomarkers are what the cancer is doing. So it can, uh, so if, it, if your microbiome is producing B vitamins, you're less likely to have cancer, and if it's metabolizing starches and sugars and things like that, you may be more on the uh, cancer side of things. So at the, since this point, um, 
the colorful picture on the bottom right. We've sequenced over 1,200 men, so this data is going to be coming out pretty soon, and it's showing some really good results in uh, future risk of prostate cancer. So you are what you eat. I did want to show kind of the concept of why the microbiome could be um, contributing. So this is Helicobacter hepaticus. So if you had a, a genetic defect already, you messed up the mouse's microbiome, they got prostate cancer. You took out their mesenteric lymph nodes, you put them in a new mouse, and they both get prostate cancer. So either, either they had the uh, mutation or not. So this is saying that it's basically the microbiome is training your immune system to uh, fight cancer. And so if you have a messed up microbiome, you're more likely to get cancer. And we showed this in the last uh, uh, slides as well, that it affects pdl one response. It affects uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer. These microbes are actually producing t testosterone. So if you have that person that you're trying to get their, P uh, their testosterone down below 10, and they're at 30, 40, it could be the microbes that are actually producing the testosterone. So this had recently come out. Uh, same thing with melanoma. Can we use the diet to influence how you respond to immunotherapy? That's happening. At, uh, this was done at MD Anderson. Um, the green tea trial that's coming out for active surveillance and prostate cancer, same thing. They're showing that the green teas are affecting and improving short-chain fatty acids in your prostate and can actually improve your outcomes. So I think this, is, uh, this was kind of my last slide of can we use NGA-based prostate cancer risk evaluation in the overall risk of prostate cancer? I think this is coming. So you could do your genetic uh, SNP profiles and genetic um, risk, and then maybe the microbiome would be layered onto that. So thank you.